Today we're going to talk about locking your keys. My name is Bill Black. I've been a business planner for about 35 years. I'm a certified exit planner and the founder and host of the Exit Coach Radio Show where I've interviewed over a thousand advisors for their tips, ideas, and precautions. And uh, I'm also a uh, uh, moderator on uh, the Vistage Fridays with Vistage series, webinar series. The Business Owner Situations and Solutions series was developed because we've talked to over 500 CEO peer groups, over 5,000 CEOs in total, and I've interviewed, as I said, over 1,000 advisors for their tips, ideas, and precautions, and we realize that business owners are too busy working to plan their futures, and we want to help our clients take more control and become better business owners. So today's topic is one I am hearing a lot from people these days on, called locking your keys. Uh, now, your best assets go home every night. I'm talking about your key employees, of course. Every day, your key employees become more valuable to your competitors. And if you don't talk to them about having a stake in the outcome, someone else will. Here's some things that I've heard from business owners. One guy said, I don't want my employee learning my methods and competing against me with my own money. Another gentleman said that my 20-year employee got a signing bonus offer from a competitor, and now he's gone. Another owner said, I've talked to my key employees about someday having a stake in the business, and now they're starting to ask me what I intend to do about it. And I want to become a part-time chairman of the business. I want to incentivize my key employees to stick around and build a balance so that they can buy me out. Those are all things I've heard from business owners over the last few years. Some of the objectives I've come up against for, from business owners, uh, they've asked me, give me a plan that I can reach out and retain my key employees so nobody takes them away. Give me something where I can reward them for extra work, a little something extra for something extra. Give me a plan that I can steal somebody else's key employee from them with. And give me something where I can help my key employees build up a balance so if they choose to someday, they can buy in uh, to the business. Owners have also, also have concerns, and some of those concerns are, one of the biggest ones is, do I get to deduct my contributions? Because I'm tired of these plans where I don't get to deduct, unless it makes a lot of sense. What does it cost to administer a plan like this? Um, what if my sale objective changes? What if I decide I want to sell to an outside buyer? How does it affect the plan? What if I decide I want to sell it to maybe another key employee? How does it affect the outcome? And my profitability can change from year to year. I need something that rolls with the punches. Some of the plan names I'm going to talk about have names to them that I've, uh, in some cases, borrowed from a, a, a marketing company. They're pretty common though. Restricted bonus, selective profit sharing, stock appreciation rights, and sale bonus. These are pretty common names out there in the planning world. So let's get into it. A restricted bonus. Now you're all familiar with a bonus, obviously. Somebody does a good job or the company has a good year, you pay out a bonus. This is like that, except it's restricted. Why is it restricted? because of the way it's set up, the employee doesn't have immediate access. So it, it really helps to retain key employees and help them build a balance. So what, what do you do? You have a, uh, a bonus criteria. You set up a bonus criteria, whatever it happens to be, and you basically say that we're going to pay that bonus amount to the employee's owned uh, insurance policy, a life insurance policy. I call it upside down life insurance policy. So instead of buying the most death benefit you can with your premium dollars. We say, uh, let's design a policy that has the lowest death benefit relative to the premium dollars. Of the, that's the bonus amount. So that the employee has the ability to grow a lot of cash values inside of that policy. Um, they have tax advantages to the growth of the dollars. They have tax advantages to the distribution of the dollars. Very common and popular approach. But with these policies, we add a special ingredient. It's a restrictive access the employee signs off on, and the employee basically says that they will agree that they won't be able to access the cash values in this policy, the bonus money itself and its growth, for a period of time, for instance, 10 years. 
unless the owner lifts the restriction. So the owner has the right to lift the restriction. If the company goes out of business, the restriction lifts. Otherwise, the restriction stays in place until the time frame expires. And if the individual called into the insurance company to request their money, they would say, we're sorry, but you're under restriction. We can't, we can't send that money to you at this point. And then hopefully you get to a point where the, the employees built up a balance and you lift the restriction and they're going to use that balance to buy into your company. That would be a desired approach. Not always the case. Um, it might just be a retirement benefit for them. To walk through it quickly, the executive and the company enter into an employment contract that specifies that a bonus will be paid based on achieving certain objectives. Those can change from year to year. The company pays life insurance premiums to the insurance company, which is a policy that is on the life of the executive, but also owned by the executive, and they name their beneficiary. However, it's got the restrictive endorsement also attached to it that says they can't access the values. When the restriction is lifted, the employee has access to cash values. If they die along the way, the restriction is not in play and their family gets or their named beneficiary gets the death benefit that they named. Very simple plan and very effective. Here's another plan design that's also effective. Selective profit sharing. Now I think you probably know how a profit sharing plan works. Uh, a lot of times it's in conjunction with your 401k plan. The problem with those traditional profit sharing plans is that you have to let everybody in who's been with you for a year or more and is over age 21 and they have a, a particular vesting schedule that you can't exceed on a maximum basis. You can't single out people for specific benefits. You certainly can't discriminate in favor of certain people. So we're talking about the concept of profit sharing but for a selective group of your employees. And so just like the bonus plan, you set a bonus criteria. You exceed a certain performance measure in your division or personally or for the company and will credit a certain amount of bonus to a pool and you'll share in that pool. Maybe the pool is one person and you get all of the pool. Maybe it's three or four people and you get a certain percentage of that pool. The employee owns the benefits only after a vesting schedule has gone by, much like your traditional profit sharing plan. Difference is those vesting schedules can be as long or short as we want them to be. We're not under the traditional restrictions for vesting schedule design. Once the employee owns that benefit, it doesn't mean they have access to it. It means that they will receive it at some future event that was specified in the document. For instance, when they left the company, um, when they died or became disabled, or a, spe a specific date in the future or at the sale of the company. So it needs to be a specific date or an event, um, uh, a timing of an event that happens in the future, at which point the employee will be paid either in lump sum or installments, depending on what the document says, and the balance will be deducted by the employer only when paid to the employee, and the employee pays taxes only when they receive that. Now, some people don't like that, and then we refer them back to the restricted bonus plan where when you when you write a bonus check to the employee's insurance policy, you as the employer get to deduct it right away. So again, a lot of times that's the criteria owners are saying, I want to deduct it. In that case, the selective profit sharing plan is not for you, but we would probably steer you back to the restricted bonus plan that we just talked about instead. Another type of program that's a little bit different um, is for employees who want to feel like they have a stake in the outcome of the growth of the company. They, wanna, they want stock, but you don't want them to have stock for a variety of reasons. And a lot of times I'll talk to employees about that, uh, why they don't want stock. They don't want the tax hit on the stock, and they don't want the cash call if the company's not doing well. So we'll talk to them about this type of plan called stock appreciation rights. The goal is to provide future benefits based on the company's growth. So the company is our measuring stick. We value the company stock and we have now a starting value and then the owner provides the employee with units that represent a percentage of the company's growth from the starting point forward. And again, there's a vesting schedule. So for the first few years, if the employee leaves, they walk away from everything. After that, we would revalue the company at the future event, which would be again the employee death or termination or their, they, uh, uh, sell the company 
or some other specified timeline, we would calculate the growth and pay out the growth to the employee uh, at that point in the future, usually by installments. So let's walk through it real quick, how it works. First, the business is valued currently. The business is revalued in the future, retirement, termination, death, disability, sale, specified date. We measure the growth and the employee has a percentage of that growth. We pay that to the employee in installment payments three to ten years based on the balance. For instance, if it's under um, if it's under fifty thousand, it might be over three years. If it's between fifty and a hundred thousand, it might be over five years. If it's longer than ten, uh, then if it's more than a hundred thousand, we might pay it over ten years. And we say that if the employee competes while they're receiving those payouts, if they compete and we find out that they're competing against the employer, uh, those future payments will stop. So it's a measure to go back and say, I'm going to pay you based on how you help me, me grow the business, but if you compete against me while we're paying you, your future payments are going to stop. Very effective measure. Lastly is a sale bonus plan, and this is in a situation where you want to retain a key employee to and pass the sale to an outside buyer and enhance the value, the sale price of your company. And in this situation, the owner is uh, made it known to his key employees that he wants to sell the business, but he also wants to reward the employee if the sale price is more than a certain amount. So you set the bonus criteria, for instance, in this case, if the company sells for more than $2 million, we'll put 50% of the excess into a bonus pool, and maybe you'll be the only participant, maybe there'll be a few key people, but you'll share in that bonus at that point. But when we divide that bonus pool, we're going to have another caveat that the, the employee must stay with the, new buy, with the buyer for three years, the new owner, for three years from the date of the sale to receive their bonus installments, and if they leave, they'll forfeit those installment payments. So once again, we're able to tell the story to a buyer that we've locked in the key employees as best we can to and past the point of sale, which enhances the value and the attractiveness of the business to the potential buyer. So when do we use these types of plans? Well, depending on what your objectives are, if your objectives are to recruit, retain, and reward, use any or any combination of these um, based on um, what makes sense for you and your objectives. If you're selling to an employee, they all make sense, obviously, except the sale bonus plan. If you're selling to an outsider, all of these will make sense. As far as the setup and administration, which is the other side of the concerns for, that we hear from owners, they're all very simple. The selective profit sharing is a little bit more complex because we have to satisfy um, we have to satisfy certain uh, regulations as far as how we set this plan up. The, the plan documents are a little bit more complicated. Usually, you're going to track investments on a hypothetical basis so you can tell the employee what their balance is worth down the road. There's a little more complexity to it. Most of these are a simple document. They're simple to explain. And traditionally, we're only explaining these plans to just a few employees at your company. So it involves some sitting down and talking uh, with them. Administratively, um, uh, two out of the four plans, you don't have to track any benefits uh, or balances because they're already tracked. In the other two, the selective profit sharing and the stock appreciation rights, you do need to track what the value of the promise is and report that to employees on a periodic basis. A couple tips and precautions. This is really not a one-size-fits-all. It's not a package kind of a plan exercise. You need to engage competent professionals who are familiar with the subject matter and get to know you and your employee situation and develop and tailor a plan to fit your needs. Um, and you need to know what your needs and goals are, so you need to be able to talk to somebody who can help bring those out if you're not sure uh, and walk you through so you can try on a couple of these plan designs, model them out financially, talk to your tax and legal and legal advisors, and the middle tip especially, have a conversation with the employees you're going to offer these to to make sure that these are going to fit their goals and needs before you just uh, thrust a plan at them and, and hope they'll enjoy it. So it, it takes some work, but it's well worth it because, again, this could be the plan design 
that recruits your next star employee. It could be the plan design that retains that person who might have left otherwise. It, that could be the person that's running the business <clears throat> while you're taking more time off or waiting for the right buyer to come along. It's a very important uh, part of plan design. This boss series, Business Owners, Situations and Solutions, we put this together so that you have short videos, articles, and checklists to help you tackle top issues that we hear about all the time. We have new content every week. Our next video will be about transitioning from being the hub to being the owner of your business. My name is Bill Black and on behalf of, on behalf of Barth Calderon where we believe that we need to help you plan today for all of your tomorrows. I want to wish you continued success and thanks so much for joining us here at the Boss Series.